Larry Greenfield is a popular conservative leader and media commentator. He is a fellow in American Studies at the Claremont Institute, where he writes and lectures on American politics and national security issues. He has traveled to some 75 countries and served in the armed forces of the United States, the Naval Intelligence Reserves. He sits on the board of the Endowment for Middle East Truth and the Israel Christian Nexus. He grew up in Los Angeles and attended high school with Daniel Pearl, a murdered Wall Street Journal reporter. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science at UC Berkeley, graduating in three years as class speaker. And he picked up his law degree at the Georgetown University Law Center. His topic tonight is Obama versus America, a clear, concise, and convincing examination of the Obama doctrine, national security failures, and homeland security policies. Let's give a warm Silicon Valley welcome. Good evening, fellow conservatives. Boy, am I glad to be here. Nowhere I'd rather be. I am from a small suburb of the Bay Area called Los Angeles County. <laughs> let, me tell you, let me tell you how much I love you. I love being back in the Bay Area where I did go to school at Cal. Go Bears, thank you. But I know there's some Stanford folks too. I like Hoover. Uh, and by the way, I have a lot of friends in the audience and friendly faces. And Thanks for being here, the Zeitmans and the Amaratis and Ellie and Jeff Wald. Let me tell you how much I'm glad to be here. I'm rooting for the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> California needs all the help it can get. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a compliment to you, Richard, and to all of your teammates here and all that you've built. Because you are part of the few who bravely stood tall and resolute when it was not yet popular against false hope and radical change from our first principles. It is always history's valiant few who stand first for freedom. Shakespeare said, he wrote about we few we happy few, we band of brothers and sisters. Those who battled for redemption from Pharaoh, the mere 300 who fought off empire at Thermopylae, the revolt of Spartacus, the storming of the Bastille, the heroic Warsaw Ghetto fighters, the flyboys of 70 years ago who answered the call, the American knights who joined in Churchill's battle of Britain. And Churchill's famous quote was, never was so much owed by so many to so few. And the blessed boys of Palm du Hoc who stormed at Normandy to save our world. So on my mind tonight and yours are the few, the proud, the Marines, soldiers, sailors, and airmen and women, Coast Guardsmen serving at home and around the world in defense of freedom, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, and compliments and thanks to those of you who served in the armed forces of the United States. And now, more and more of our fellow citizens are joining our cause for liberty, security, prosperity, and virtue. But I know, and you know, that we were among the few before it was popular. John Winthrop, almost 400 years ago, the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony when the settlers landed, was inspired by the Sermon on the Mount when he declared that he was founding a new Zion. You are a light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Nor the men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine 
that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. A student of the Sermon on the Mount and of this leader of the settlers to our new continent was none other than California's 33rd governor and the 40th president of the United States, President Ronald Wilson Reagan, who said in his farewell address, I too have spoken of the shining city all my political life. In my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with peoples of all kinds, bringing and living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. That's how I saw it and see it still. From Massachusetts to the Golden State of California, from sea to shining sea, God truly has blessed America. Thank you. Well, most Americans are focused on the economy and the poor performance of this White House. The stimulus is not stimulated. The bailouts went to union friends. The financial industry regulations rewarded friends and cronies. Under Presidents Reagan, Clinton, and Bush, deficits shrank from 5 to 3 to sometimes 1 or 2% of GDP. Under Mr. Obama, they're over 10%. We've seen more debt in 19 months of the Obama administration than from President George Washington through Bill Clinton combined. Taxes are up, 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 and they are glad. The crowd which wants to spread the wealth doesn't understand that taxing and spending and growing the federal workforce doesn't help us compete globally, start up new businesses, create jobs for our kids and grandkids. Mr. Obama was famously asked if it could be proven that higher taxes did not result in more revenue to the government. Would he still be for them? And he said, yes. It's a matter of, quote, fairness. The signature issue of this administration has not been job growth or making the U.S. more competitive globally or energy independence or next generation technologies or rising wages or more home affordability or entitlement reform or securing retirements for the baby boomers and saving us from the train wreck that is coming our way, the Ponzi scheme that is the Social Security and Medicare government domination. It was, of course, the cram down of the health care reform plan, which is simply an unbelievable power grab by the left done in the dark of night. Why did it take 2,309 pages? The Declaration of Independence was 1,337 words. The Ten Commandments are 313 words. The Gettysburg Address, 272. The American people understand all that's wrong with the health care bill, including, by the way, ruining all the small businesses that were in the student loan business. They federalized it. They hired 20 to 30,000 IRS agents to impose the federal mandate you must buy federal mandated health insurance. I could go on and on. And so the American people have awakened. And the left will hear from us indeed with our new attitude on November 2nd. <laughs> but I came this evening to talk about the other half, not domestic politics, but foreign policy. And I have labeled the Obama doctrine, hug a thug and offend our friends. <laughs> <laughs> 